John saw a golden city, New Jerusalem come down. Well, jasper walls and gates of pearl, such splendor all around. And he tells about a river of life that flows beneath the throne, where we'll drink and live eternally, a mansion all our own. Oh, if that don't make you want to go, brother, that don't make you want to go, sister, that don't make you want to go, heaven, I don't know what does. They say there is no heartache there, and no more curse or sin, no sickness and no cross to bear, and death can't enter in. No fighting and no battlefields, no war, no enemies. Where the lamb and lion lay side by side, in the land of perfect peace. Oh, if that don't make you want to go, brother, that don't make you want to go. Sister, that don't make you want to go. Heaven, I don't know what does. Oh, if that don't make you want to go, brother, that don't make you want to go, sister, that don't make you want to go to heaven, I don't know what does. No worries and no more to fear, our faith will be made sight. It's a glorious land of endless days when Jesus is alive. Got a lot of friends and loved ones there, never I will meet. And I'll lay my crown of jewels down when I bow at Jesus' feet. Oh, if that don't make you want to go, brother, that don't make you want to go. Sister, that don't make you want to go. I don't know. Oh, I don't know what does. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We ask that you just pour out your spirit on us, Lord. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your joy. Lord, and open our hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good, good. Uh, and someone said, how are you? I'm doing good as well. Uh, we have a few announcements for you this morning. First of all, if you are a visitor to Calvary, welcome. We are so glad you are here. Uh, Steve is guest leading worship this morning, which is always a fun time. I love it. Um, if, if you're curious, Alicia is out doing worship at her old church for a women's retreat this weekend. And of course, I'm missing her very much, but that's okay. A few other announcements for you. Our kids ministry is having an awesome, awesome bowling party coming up now. Unfortunately, they're actually full. So if you haven't signed up yet, there is a kind of a, a backup list just in case there are cancellations. So if you do want to sign up, make sure you sign up. Uh, right now we're full, but there is a, a backup list just in case. You can go ahead over to uh, see Juliet and the Kids Ministry for more information on that. And of course, we're always looking for people to help out in Kids Ministry and really all around the church. Uh, because ministry is, of course, uh, a place where we always see a need. So if you're interested in helping out with that, again, please see Juliet, Socorro, or myself. Um, we're also having our Collide citywide events, and this is for our youth group, uh, junior high and high school students. It is going to be an absolutely amazing, amazing time. We're bringing in a, a band. We're bringing in, um, I think, about six other youth groups right now. And uh, it's going to be an amazing, amazing time. There's food trucks. There's going to be fun games outside. It's just a whole, whole party focused on teaching who Jesus is, focused on giving the gospel to as many kids as possible. So 
If you know any junior high, high school students, please invite them out. That is May 21st, and that is a Saturday afternoon into the evening from 4 to 7. And again, it's going to be a whole, whole lot of fun. And it's a free event, so make sure you can check that out if you can. Also, I want to just point out something in the bulletin. If you notice that there's the, in the Shine Women's Ministry section, it says prayer, 8 o'clock p.m. on Saturday. That should read a.m. So if you, re, if you come here at 8 o'clock p.m., I'm so sorry. That is my <laughs> fault. Please forgive me, but go home and next week go at 8 a.m., okay? So if you're looking for the women's prayer, again, Saturday, 8 a.m., not p.m. With all of that being said, why don't you go ahead and stand up and say hi to someone around you. You can go ahead and sit down. That's fine. Sorry. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going. To see the King, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. We're going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King, hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the King. Go back. the king just a few more days and we're going to see our king just a few more days and we're going to see our king just a few more days and we're going to see our king hallelujah hallelujah we're going to see our King. 
Go ahead and stand one more time since the song actually says, I stand. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Let's sing that again. And in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love Sing it out. Singing, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful, is my Savior's love for me. Amen. He took my sins 
and my sorrows and made them his very own he bore the burden to calvary and suffered and died all alone singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me when ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me singing how marvelous how wonderful shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever Lord, we just stand amazed before you, all that you do and all that you've done and continue to do, Lord, in our lives, like just to making, making us whole, Lord. You, you've given us hope, you've given us strength, and Lord, you've given us eternal life with you. From the first day, Lord, that we asked you into our hearts, you were knocking, and, you, and the first day that we asked you in, Lord. That was our first day of eternity with you. And we thank you for that and praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. It is exciting to be here. It's just uh, it's neat to come to a church that's full. In fact, first service is filling up. And it's, it's, just, uh, it's just awesome to see what God's doing at Calvary Chapel Maricopa, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, uh, this is, uh, we're here, Denise and I, and our, our, uh, our daughter, our youngest, who's 21, is out here this weekend with us from Alabama, and, uh, um, and we'll be back out to teach again May 8th, yeah, before we actually get here full time. Uh, I, I shared with first service, I was just like, well, first I got to take care of stuff. Junior high and high school, you're dismissed with Mike, right? And, uh, and then I also want to draw attention to this. Ministry takes place in a lot of different ways. We have people that meet here uh, and pray during the week and, and home Bible studies that pray for needs. And you can stay connected, connected to a body who you know is going to be praying for you by filling out a prayer request sheet or an information sheet. If you want to serve, you've been going here you want to know more about Calvary Chapel Maricopa, what we're all about, or, or anything, fill this out so somebody can contact you and we, they won't hound you or beat on your door unexpectedly. Just, um, just want to love on you. And, and so get to know everybody. Um, so anyway, first service, uh, I was sharing <laughs> a little bit. We, um, we came out. We were the third 
uh, guy to come out and, and, so to speak, interview for the senior pastor position here at Calvary Chapel Maricopa. And I'm so grateful that I wasn't the, the uh, first because um, we were the third and I had about a week. And, <laughs> and I, Denise and I, we just feel like, man, we're supposed to be here. We, God had convicted our hearts. And so I was going, oh, Lord, what if, what if they choose somebody else? What if, you know, I'm going to just break my heart. And uh, so we had about a week. Good thing it wasn't three weeks. And uh, so I just kind of kept my thoughts focused and, and praying. And then that Saturday, uh, Pat Kenny from Poyman called and said, uh, well, Raj, you ready to move? You know, and I said, oh, my goodness. Our, my heart just, uh, you know, just didn't know. Just almost stopped beating. So um, it, we are so blessed to, to be the new pastor here. And, and uh, in the message, you'll, you'll kind of get a little bit of our heart for ministry, hopefully, and know that it's, it's not going to be about me and it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do through this body and through this church. And, uh, and he's going to continue to do great, great things. Again, we're glad that it's not about uh, a per- one person. You know? I mean, you guys had a church that uh, the pastor felt called of God to, to go to England and to plant a church. And so you went almost six months without a senior pastor, and, and the church continued to grow. That, that says a lot to me about, about a, a body of believers that are committed to, to the work of Jesus Christ. And, and it's not about one guy. It's not, you know, we're going to, you know, learn about that this morning, that it's not about uh, me or you or a great worship team. It's, it's, about, it's about Jesus and taking Jesus uh, just to our city, our community, meeting each other's needs, praying for one another, and, uh, and doing just watching God move. And so we are excited. Now, this morning, if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand because it's important. We want you to follow along. Um, so you can raise your hand and we can get you some Bibles. Guys back here in the back, Liz needs one. So I mean, most people have them on their electronically on your phone or whatever. That's totally cool. Just make sure you turn the volume down so it doesn't ring when, uh, you know, your aunt says dinner's ready or whatever, lunch. <laughs> Supper in the South. Supper's, yeah, supper's like at noon or whatever. And it just confuses me. It's like, no, it's lunch. Never did get that. But <laughs> this morning we're going to be in Colossians Chapter 1, and the title of the message is, uh, is Christ, Christ Headlines, right? Christ Headlines. Christ has preeminence. He's first. He's above all things in the message. Now, Colossians is one of four what we call prison epistles, okay? We have got uh, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon's. Ephesians. These are all four letters, epistles, written by Paul from a Roman cell. You know, I, I think some of his greatest work. These are, these, are, these are really descriptive in what just not the Christian is supposed to live out, but also, also the church and the purpose of the church. And this morning, we're going to find out just a little bit more of who Jesus is to us. And he is, he is so amazing. And, and so I just love to learn more and more about Jesus, and the scriptures just overflow with knowledge. Now, first, uh, the chapter 1 of Colossians, it begins with uh, Paul. Paul giving thanks to God, you see, because he's praying. And he'll say, I'm praying for you three different times in this first chapter for the Colossians. He says, I'm praying for you in, three, in verses 3 and 4, always. Since we heard of your faith in Jesus and love for all the saints. The Apostle Paul says, I'm always praying for you. That, I, mean, I don't take that it would be in Scripture if he was lying. Right? Like he's praying always and he just sort of prays whenever he just feels like it. No, he was praying always. Always for this church. Making intercession for them. Secondly, in, in verses 7 and 8, it says, Paul says that... Uh, uh, you know, we heard and, and knew of the grace of God and truth, learning from Epaphras. This is what we heard about you. You grew. You heard. You knew the grace of God and truth. And you learned from Epaphras, the pastor, who, when Paul wrote this letter in Rome, he penned it. He put it in the hands of Epaphras and sent him back to Colossae with this letter for this church. So we know that Epaphras was the pastor of there. And, and that they're a servant. Epaphras was a servant, a fellow minister of Christ on your behalf. 
who declared to us your love in the Spirit. What, what accommodations this church has. I mean, they, you know, for all purposes, they're doing it right. Paul is pleased. And in verse 9, for this reason, for these reasons, the fact that I'm praying for you always, and we've, we've heard all these great things about you, that Paul says, these are our prayer requests. This is what we've been praying for you. And he says, we've been asking the Lord that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and spiritual understanding that they walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in, in every good work, that they increase in the knowledge of God, that they be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience, long-suffering, and joy. That is a wonderful prayer request, isn't it? To know that you have the Apostle Paul praying that. And I believe that Jesus is making intercession for the saints and praying something similar to this every day for us. Every day. For Paul had the heart of Jesus for the Colossi church. And this was his prayer request. But notice what he's praying. He, he's not praying that they had be, be born again. That they would uh, learn of the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. But he, he's commending them as believers. And he's commending them for for walking in the faith and, and loving and having that love in the Spirit. You see, but even in Colossae, there's, there was, a, there was a, a false theology that had crept in. Angelology, the worship of angels or, or spiritual beings. This had crept in. And like today, all this type of stuff creeps in to the church in America. We'll talk some more about that. But So he's wanting to, to lay a foundation in chapter 1 that Jesus is supreme. That Jesus has top billing. That Jesus has, in other words, preeminence. Period. And we're going to talk about that this morning. So let's pray and open our service. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for the gift of salvation and we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives, personally and corporately. We thank you for this church, and we ask, God, that you would continue to lead us and guide us, be our strength, Lord, and we pray that, that you would just continue to do just amazing work here. I mean, just pack this place out. I pray that we just all be standing up and, and sitting in chairs out there in the hallway because you will provide. And Lord, we just offer uh, this morning and this time that to you in such a way that you would speak to us. We pray your spirit would, would just give us all personal insight to just who you are and that we grab a hold of that and be strengthened in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. And so the Apostle Paul is, is, um, is really, again, laying that fa foundation in Colossae. I had said that this was four of... Uh, four uh, epistles that we call the, the um, prison epistles that, that Paul wrote from Rome, right around 62 to 63 A.D. Now, I don't know if, if, if you're aware, but A.D. doesn't stand for, like, his death. You know, we, that didn't stop there, start there. But it really means, that definition A.D. means year of our, the year of our Lord. Which, so A.D. starts at the birth of Christ. Okay, and so he was 30 when he began his ministry. He had a three-year ministry, so when he was crucified, he was right around 33 years old. So if we took 62 to 63 A.D. and took 33 years off of that, we're right about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that Paul writes this letter. I did the math right. First service, I was all messed up. So I had to get my calculator out. Um, so... so uh, uh, so this is, this is where, um, when this letter is written and uh, the time frame. Now, uh, again, we're talking about the foundation, Christ having preeminence. Christ, Paul is saying Christ is the fullness of God. He is the fullness of God, and he will expound on that. He who has preeminence in all things. Christ, again, gets top billing. He headlines. He headlines. It's not the hour of power with pastor. No, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. That's how it was. Paul wasn't, 
Paul wasn't like, you know, when he came into town, they didn't throw lights up. It's the Apostle Paul and the gospel he preaches. No, 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 no. It was, it was Jesus, man. Paul says, I'm nothing. It's Jesus. He's the one who has preeminence. This was his gospel. This was his gospel. And I would think that anything else would be sort of a false apostle that came to town preaching something different. So let's begin our passage here in verse 12 of chapter 1 of Colossae. So after praying for them and praying those amazing needs, Paul goes into giving thanks. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed, to, uh, conveyed us into the kingdom of his Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You see, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is <clears throat> excuse me, the, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Top billing. He is God. So the Apostle Paul here, after praying for them and uh, explaining his petition to God and commending them, he says, now, <laughs> giving thanks to God, giving thanks to the Father, and he says, who has qualified us? Now, that just caught me off guard. Qualified me? Qualified. I don't feel much qualified. I don't feel much qualified to be a Christian, to, to associate myself with Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean, in the flesh, I'm like, man, you know, Jesus, and I'm just messed up. I don't feel much qualified. I know I didn't feel qualified the day that I asked the Lord into my heart. But you see, we are qualified because of his work on the cross, because of what he's done. Again, because he headlines, because he has preeminence, because he is the image of God, is what he's explaining. So, giving thanks to God, the, to the Father, excuse me, who has qualified us to be partakers of what? The inheritance of the saints in the light. Jesus, light of the world. I'm the light of the world. In him, there's no, not, a, not a smidgen of darkness. There can't be. He is absolutely perfect. We are partakers of the inheritance of the saints. It's a corporation. We're grouped together. It's an inheritance that we're qualified for and, and he and partakers of. Not because I'm a good person. Not because there's anything that I have done or you've done that has qualified me. What's qualified me is the love and the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And his work on the cross. Therefore, he has preeminence. Therefore, I will put no one higher on the billboard of my life than Jesus Christ and him alone. He has delivered us. So we are qualified, and, it, and now we are delivered, for again, from that power of darkness, and he has conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, of his love. Son of his love. He's going to talk about this, this he, that Jesus Christ is the invisible, or the, excuse me, the visible image of an invisible God. And what is that? What is that image? That image, it says right here, is the Son of His love. When you when you look at Christ, into the into the, and you you look into that perfect law of love, that's all that you see. You see, the Old Testament didn't produce that, but man, that work on the cross produced that. It's amazing. Blows my mind. But the idea here, again, that he's delivered us from the power of darkness. Because again, there's not a smidgen of darkness or evil within him. He is the Lord of light. Perfect light. And he has conveyed us into the kingdom of his son. That word convey is kind of unique in the Greek. You see, when an emperor would go and conquer a city... He would take the people of that city and bring them into his city. 
right? They will become his people. These are my people. You see, that's what this, this, what this word means. You see, Jesus, he's came over here, and he has conquered the world, sin and death. And he has taken you, my friend, as a believer in Jesus Christ, and now has conveyed you, has brought you into his kingdom. You are his kid. That is amazing. It's just, cool, right on. Because he has preeminence, and only he can do that. Only he can do that. Into the kingdom of the son of his love. Who doesn't want to be in that kingdom? I want to live in that kingdom. I want to be a part of that kingdom. Even right here, I want to be a part of that kingdom. That is awesome. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sin. Listen, you are not going to reach a state of perfection on this side of eternity. You, can, you, will, you will never be sinless you will sin less. The closer you get to Jesus and the more that you learn about his preeminence and his glory and his purpose in your life and his power, we will sin less and less. You see, in the South, there's a sect or group of people that, that are, call themselves believers that believe that once you've given your life to Jesus, that you have reached a level of perfection, that you sin no more, period. You're sinless. Wow. I don't know how that happens, but, but uh, that's kind of frustrating because... Uh, when, the, when you're convicted, man, I blew it. I lost my temper on traffic. Who doesn't lose their temper in traffic? You know, and you're like, ah! And you're like, I want to ram them. I just want to ram them, Lord. I wish I was driving a big truck so I could ram them. And then you have to say, God, I'm sorry. That's not cool. That's a little bit of darkness and evil. And that's, you know, I mean, you know, so I know that I'm not perfect. But God is working in us, right? He is forgiving us of our sin. It's through the blood that redemption redeemed that purchased possession, speaking of what he just, you know, the inheritance of the saints in the light and delivered from power of darkness and conveyed us into his kingdom. It's through that redemption of his blood. And that's why he has preeminence. He has top billing in your life and in this world. That's the banner I want to live under right there. And so he goes on. <clears throat> And he has 13. He has delivered us, again, from the power of darkness. We just taught on that. In whom we have redemption. We just taught on 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All creation. Not a part of it, but every ounce of it. He is the image. The image of the infallible, infinite God. He is not me, not you, not Buddha, no one else. No one else can do that. No one claimed, no one claimed, listen, not only, we, we talk about it, no one's claimed to die for the unrighteous. No one died for the penalty of sin but Jesus. But let's go a step further. What other God claims to be the creator of the universe and exist, pre-existed before it, the universe existed? And claims that by, by me all things consist. God Almighty. And Jesus, he, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, this word image is, is an ancient Greek word. It has two ideas. Two ideas behind it. One, likeness, the image of, such as like the coin or reflection in a mirror. Jesus is that reflection of God. When he walked the earth, he was a reflection of God. Secondly, it has a second meaning, the manifestation, with the sense that God is fully revealed or was fully revealed in Jesus. So it wasn't just a reflection, but the true manifestation of God, the image of God. And you wonder, you wonder why sinners ran to him, why people ran to him and fell at his feet. Heal me, such as the leper, from last week, right? Or the blind guy, or the woman with an issue of, of blood, or all these different people throughout the New Testament. You wonder why? Because they saw the image. Now, not everybody sees that. Not everybody saw that. But Zacchaeus did when he climbed that tree, that, that little tax collector that was robbing everybody blind. Yeah, yeah. He heard and saw the image of the invisible God. 
He saw the manifestation of God and he ran and he climbed a tree. And God met his need and he was delivered. He is that image. Not merely similar as some would teach. If you believe anything else, you can, you know, well, but no, hold on. No. Jesus was similar to God. Actually, Michael, the archangel's brother, not. He was God. This is what scripture's teaching us. You got to be careful because just like in Colossae, we have all kinds of ideology and theology that creeps in under the church, right? The worship of anything else, even a man other than an angel. Remember what the scripture says? If an angel or anyone else comes preaching any other gospel, it's not the gospel. Right? It creeps in today, man. You've got to be careful that we're not worshiping anything else but Jesus and that he alone has preeminence in our lives. He is the knowable God. Exalted. Knowable. He becomes known. Think about it. You can know him. You can know him. What a personal God. The firstborn over all creation. This idea of firstborn is an amazing Greek word as well. And it describes both priority in time and supremacy in rank. You see, if, if, we, if we look at the Greek and we, and we really look at what was really being said, you will never come up with any other conclusion than the fact that Jesus was God incarnate. There he is. Anything else is a fraud. You see, Paul used it. He used both ideas in his gospel here. Both, all things created and Jesus being supreme than any other created thing. If this is true, he created the angels to carve something out of a piece of wood and worship it, how foolish is that? He created the tree. To carve something out of stone and to worship that, how foolish is that? He created the stone. To worship a man who he created, how foolish is that? Paul's making a pretty profound statement. Keep your eyes on Jesus. For sure, keep your eyes on Jesus. The firstborn, the firstborn who has preeminence. Now in no way, this firstborn indicate that Jesus was less than God, but God, but God. A lot of times we can get in, you know, some people will twist this around and take the idea that, that Jesus was a created being, but he was, he was in the beginning. You follow me? Just like John, John 1. I, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to it because it's such a powerful verse. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. Let's see, in my Bible, it's page number, <laughs> yeah. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. John nails it. I love this. And if you're ever witnessing, this is a wonderful place to take a believer, or a non-believer, right to the scriptures. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God? Who's the Word? Jesus Christ, Right? He was the beginning, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness, it didn't comprehend it. Isn't that what Paul's trying to say? He has preeminence. He has it nailed down. Okay. So for by him, all things, all things were created. This means that everything exists and operates into his command. At his command. Now, how does that affect your prayer life? If everything operates at his command, and scripture tells us to go before him and just ask, knock, seek, and don't stop. That affects my faith. The more I know of God, it affects the way I pray. I can pray, God, I know you love me. I know. I know you want to save that person. I know you want to heal that person. You know, 
There's no doubt. The scriptures tell us, pray without doubting. Well, this is how you do it, by believing this about God. You're not doubting. God is huge. He's preeminent. He controls all things, and all things are controlled by him. Now, if you're one of those stargazers that are just blown away at the vastness of our universe, how big it is and how we'd be burnt up if the sun was just a little out of tilt or, or uh, the stream is so long behind a comet and just blows your mind. That's awesome. I'm a little more simple too. On the other hand, I, I sort of look at my brother or my sister in Christ and I go, wow, for by him all things were created. Wow. Look at that right there. God made that. Denise and I were grandparents. We've got a, uh, our grandson will be five in June, and uh, you'll meet him. He's coming down, a little rider. He's so cool. He's the coolest kid ever. And then we've got this little little girl, Josephine Lennox. Lennox. She's like three months old, and she's cool too. She can't talk or do nothing yet, but make noises. But, uh, uh, but anywho, they're so cool. And I look at them, and I go, God, you created all. I don't have to look at, at a comet, or I don't have to be fascinated by, by, the, by the rotation of the sun and the earth. I, I look at my grandkids, and I go, wow. I'm just, I'm just in love. There's no doubt that God controls all things. It's amazing. Amazing how God is. Uh, anyway, so moving forward. Again, everything stands created because of Jesus Christ and who he is and his dominance, if you would. And everything remains created because of his dominance and who he is. Our Jesus dominates. He dominates the universe. The universe does not revolve around me, and it doesn't revolve around you. It revolves around Jesus Christ. He has preeminence. He is before all things. Who is the beginning? The preexistent one. Man, oh man. Before all things, just as John said in John 1, Jesus is in control. In him all things consist. This has the idea that Jesus is both the unifying principle and the personal sustainer of all creation. Man, he is expounding their faith at Colossae. They're just going right on. That's my Jesus he sustains everything. And so again, bringing this down to a practical, practical level, when I face troubles and difficulties, God is my sustainer. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking to him. All things are, it's all good. He's going to make good on this. You know, I might have to dig my heels in and I might have to hang on for dear life. But God's going to see me through and he's going to see you through. No matter what you face, no matter what opposition heads your way, you have a God who, who controls everything and sustains everything, including you and the breath you take every day. That's, that's what Christianity, right there. We're not just, we're just not living in this world, driving around randomly, just hoping to survive another day. That's what I used to do before I knew Jesus. Now that I'm in Jesus, my life is planned out. I have a path, I have a direction, and I have purpose, and so do you. That's awesome. All things consist in him. He is the preserver. He was the one who continues to cause everything to operate as it does. Now, I'm not much of, of a tree hugger, but um, that's why global warming doesn't freak me out. Right? I'm not going to invest my money in all that foolishness because God's got it all under control. Amen? I mean, come on. You see how foolish the world is? You see, if God's got preeminence, you're like, God's got that. Yes, I want to take care of my, the earth we live in. It's a gift from God. I don't want to destroy it. But on the other hand, I'm not worried. Because I know anyway it's all coming apart. He's got a plan, and we're all moving towards that end. That end. I mean, we're just waiting for the rapture of the church right now. Right? God's got this. God's got this. Now, he is the head of the body. He is the church. He is the head. 
He is the head of the body. He has preeminence. Now, this is going to amaze you, but what blows my mind, again, this church went six months, roughly, without a pastor and is growing, and the seats are all full. You know why? Because it wasn't built on Chris, and it won't be built on Roger. It's not the hour of power with pastor, no matter who we wanted to get. It's the hour of power with Jesus. It's not about me. I'm, I could fall over dead tomorrow. God's going to choose. He'll raise up, and this church will go because it's Jesus who's, who's got this. Now, if your church is all about, and I don't mean to be bashing. They can do whatever they want. I know what we're not going to do. It's not about programs. It's about Jesus. It's not about a building. No, it's not about a man. It's not about a, 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 a form uh, or, or some kind of idea. It's about the Word of God. It's about Jesus. And he not only is our life independently, but this church is going to operate that way. And you watch what God's going to do. You watch and see. Because when we have this in right order, not only our personal lives, but the church corporately, just watch and see what God's going to do. Watch and see. He is the head of the church. This describes Jesus' relationship to the church. He is the head. Now, some theologians believe this. This is kind of described like the head of a body of water, the beginning, the headwaters of a river. It's where everything begins because that's, that's within context. But also, he is, he is the head. He, he's the one that, you know, you lop my head off, my arms aren't going to move. Right? I mean, he's the head. He has preeminence. He's in full control. He sustains everything. He's the life giver. His role is the source, the single source of this church and the single source of your life. That's what it means to have preeminence. That again, all things, that in all things he may have preeminence. That he would have, be first in all things, that he would headline Paul has been building up to this one point. This is the summary. This is where he's been going with all this. Praying for this church and laying that foundation to get their eyes off of this whole idea that was creeping into the church of worshiping a, a spirit angel or some kind of angel sacrament or whatever they had going on. The scriptures talk about that here that he is the fullness. Right? 18, that he has preeminence. And then 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. That is a powerful verse, and let me tell you why. The word fullness is translated in the Greek to, to, to recognize, it's a technical term, if you would, to denote the totality and of the divinity, divine powers that Jesus has. Okay, let me say that again. He denotes the totality of the divine powers and attributes of Jesus Christ. He is the fullness. He, he's, Paul's saying, man, he is God. He, he's the image, the physical image of God. In totality, in completeness, and in divinity. Take your Jehovah's Witness to that verse in the Greek. Right? What do you mean he's a, or, or you're Mormon or anyone else that believes Jesus is anything else but God? You know, this is the sad part. And this is why we do that. We dumb that down because, you see, we can manipulate. We want to we have a God that's, that's not complete. That he's not the fullness, the totality and divinity of God himself, incarnate. Why? So we can manipulate him. We can control him. We can make him how we want him. Make him. You know, we, we, don't, we can't offend him because we, we sort of, you know, he only can, uh, has the powers that, that we want him to have. You know, he only, he only is as big as we want him to be. And we, we, can, we can fool with that kind of God. You can't, Paul says you can't fool with this kind of God. You either worship him or you don't. He either has preeminence or he don't. Period. Paul wanted to emphasize the idea that Jesus was not just temporarily God, but permanently God. He is God. What a powerful, powerful idea. You know, it's, 
it says in Scripture that at one point that it pleased the Father to bruise him. Now it, it pleased the Father to lift him up. Although he had that preeminence at the beginning, it pleased him to bruise him. And now the gospel, it pleased him to put him right back up here. Where he should dwell. This idea with, with dwells is a powerful word. The ancient Greek word for dwell here is used, again, in the sense that uh, a permanent dwelling place, not just a, a temporary dwelling place. All the fullness that I just explained, is, is he, it dwells within him permanently, not temporarily. He is the head of the church, the head of our lives. All this fullness has been put into Jesus Christ. Again, it hasn't been put into the church. It hasn't been put into the priesthood. It hasn't been put into a building. It hasn't been put into a sacrament. It hasn't been put into any particular saint, method, or program. It's been put into Jesus Christ, who has preeminence, top billing, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, that atoning work. Only by Jesus. Only by Jesus. And the blood of the cross. And the blood of the cross. 21. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. He's talking about Roger. <laughs> Before I knew Jesus. You were alienated, you were separated, and you were wicked and evil prior to knowing him. I don't know, maybe you weren't as bad as me, but you were separated. Nonetheless, <laughs> you were separated. Those wicked works, yet now he's reconciled. He has is, he is, he is joined you to himself through that atoning work on the cross. What you could not do he has done. Pretty simple. 22. In the body of his flesh, again, through the death, this is how he reconciled you. In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Now, <laughs> let's stop for a minute. 21 just condemned me, alienated, and an enemy in my mind of God by my wicked works. And yet, after being reconciled by his body and his broken flesh, his death, he has done that to present you and I holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. What, what a contrast. Is Paul, is Paul, that's, that's a pretty amazing contrast. Do you agree? It's the simplicity of the gospel. That's who you are this morning in Christ. He has done that. That reconciling work, has done. he's made you that way. That's who you are. But I want to talk a little bit about a condition here in closing. 23, if indeed you continue. Now the word if is a conditional, is it not? Now, I am saved by grace through faith, and I am predestined, chosen by a sovereign God, and so are you. And today, in churches all over the world, people are coming to faith. And those people were chosen by a sovereign God, predestined. Because, because how could he not? He is preeminence. He is sovereign. He knows all things before time. How could he not know that I was going to come to faith seven, 27 years ago? He's God. Yet, this condition says, if I continue in the faith, if I continue to walk this out. Now, it, it, this condition might freak you out for a minute. You're, it, it's got this element of works, right? Right? Now you're saying, I'm saved by grace through faith. It's all, I've been reconciled because of the work on the cross. And, and now you're saying there's this condition. There's this little bit of work that I've got to do to maintain my salvation. Yes, but Scripture teaches that you're not alone. You don't have to do this alone. You don't have to do this in your own strength. You'd be foolish if you tried. And we do sometimes. You do this by the power of God and the testimony of his word 
and the work of his Holy Spirit. He has given you everything to accomplish this. If, indeed, Roger, you walk in the faith, grounded. In other words, this idea is remaining grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard. I got to stick to it. I got to abide, right? John 15, abide in the vine and you will bear much fruit, right? Apart from me, you can do nothing, right? Abide, abide, abide. So if, if you abide, hear my words. Allow me to change your life, to move you, and to motivate you this direction. You know, <laughs> we have two kids, and our lovely daughter's in the back, and our lovely son is going to be moving down here. You'll meet him. He's a wonderful man. But as a child, he was <laughs> supremely strong-willed. <laughs> the strong man, I mean, he was strong-willed, that kid. I mean, when he, right when he came out. And, and I think sometimes as Christians, we're, there's some of us that are strong-willed. We're strong-willed. Almost like, the, you know, we get stiff necks. You know, God says, hey, go this way. And we're like, oh, I'm going to go this way. And God's going, no, I want you to go. I love you, man. Go this way. Do this. I want you to make this decision. No, oh, no, 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 no. And finally, God's got to do something. He's got to break a bone. He's got to sit you down. He's got to put you in a corner. Put your nose against the wall for a little bit. And you, you know, and you got to sit there and think about it for a minute. And then you go, all right, okay. I'm, all right, all right, since I'm busted, I'm totally busted here. You know, like, like you tell you bust a kid, you catch them with their hand in the cookie jar, and, and they're still going to go, you got a cookie behind your back? No, nope. no, and they're, you know, no, they're, they're, I mean, okay, show me your hands. You know, no, show me the other hand. You know, and they're doing it, the, show me both hands. You know, they're not busted until there it is, there's the cookie. You know, it's kind of, and some of us as Christians, we're kind of like that. You know, we don't need to be like that, man. You know, God has done it, okay? He, he, we don't need to be strong-willed. We need to allow his will in our lives to motivate us and move us and realize I don't have to accomplish this. I just got to have him as, at the head. He's got a headline in my life. He's got to have top billing in my life and in your life and in this church and in our country. That's the whole idea. That's what Christianity is. He's got top billing. I go to him with my problems. I go to him looking for answers. I go to him looking for strength. He's my motivation. He's my savior. Right? This is what Paul's saying. He's saying, if you indeed continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from that hope, the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I don't know how that's going to take place, but God's sovereign, and everyone's going to hear the gospel. We'll all stand before him, right? That's amazing. May God have preeminence. May he have, be just supreme in our lives. I just want to put him up here. I don't want anyone else up here but God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for your word this morning, for your encouragement. And uh, Lord, I don't want anyone here to leave without their spiritual needs met, that they'd be prayed for if they need prayer, if they don't know you as personal Lord and Savior, if they don't have that hope, that anchor of faith, God, I pray. I pray, Lord, that they would not leave here without meeting you, to be being introduced to you, the King of glory. And Lord, uh, this next week, who knows what we're gonna run into? We don't know what's out there, but we know that you're with us every step of the way. And we thank you for that. Keep us safe until next week. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Worship, guys, you want to come up and play that last song? Thank you, Pastor Roger. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have
thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men. Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger Almighty infinite Father faithfully loving your own here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne oh a falling before your throne you the one that we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for oh our hearts always hunger for you are the one that the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. God bless you. And have a blessed day. Father, we thank you for just bringing your grace and your glory in our midst, and we pray, Lord, that you would continue to unfold your plan and your mystery before us, Lord, as we walk in faith and, and trusting you. Lord, I thank you for all of the prayers that have been answered, for, for those who have been seeking needs, and, and Lord, I just ask that you continue to um, help us to trust you and to seek you in everything that we do, Lord, as we go forth this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.